I, for years, I refused to use the word abstract. Um, for me, there really is no abstraction. Um, when even the paintings that look most abstract, there's some kind of figurative um, or figural presence. Um, I always want there to be um, at least the trace of a human figure, or sometimes an animal, but even the paintings that look the most abstract, there's still a kind of figurative space. I want there to always be a feeling that there's a place that you can enter into. Um, and this is partly because I'm most drawn to figurative paintings by other people from the past and present. Um, and in a way, my, my whole, all my work is a conflict between figuration and abstraction, and my desire to paint the figure, and my refusal to allow the figure to, to remain. As soon as the figure gets too clear, I find it, it gets too close to illustration, or describing something, or it gets too, I cannot keep this clear figure, I have to obscure it, or not obscure, but, um, I want to invent a new kind of figure, so there's, I think there's a sort of uneasiness um, and it results in this back and forth between there being a clear figure and not so much. Um, and this comes and goes constantly. And over the years, I've realized within each painting, I want there to be a conflict, but also within from one painting to the next. And more and more, I become interested in the relationship between the paintings, and I want there to be a kind of argument going on between the paintings. So just as something, I never want to be saying, this is the way it is. So whenever anything becomes too pinned down and too, you know, when I feel like I'm naming something too, in too final a way, that's when I feel I have to say, but is it really like that? So it's all really about ambiguity and keeping things up in the air. And the idea of wanting people to look for a long time is that, you know, if I want the uh, imagery to always be in a state of flux, so that as you're looking at something, you think you've got it, and then you look away and look back, or you look to another part of the painting, and you're kept in this kind of state of uneasiness, where you're never completely sure of what you're looking at. Now, that's a fine line between making a frustrating experience for people, because I don't want people to be, you know, Oh, for God's sake, what is it then, after all? It's more that it's the painting itself that I want you to look at. In the end, it doesn't matter that much what it's of. You know, you'll bring your own story to it. It matters to me while I'm painting it, but I really want the paintings to have a life of their own, and they do move and change while you look at them. They change from one day to the next. Um, I mean, I, it's very romantic to say, but I find painting very mysterious, all painting, and I think I've always wanted to exploit the properties that only painting has. This probably comes from painting at a time, starting out at a time when people were so against painting and one was constantly having to justify doing it. So I always wanted to use, you know, to have, uh, to make something that could only be made in paint. And I think the properties of paint encourage this kind of mobile, kind of slippery, um, elusive, all these qualities where um, things are constantly in a state of morphing into something else. Um, well, I had a very influential teacher, um, her name was Maggie Handling, a British painter, and um, I couldn't get into art school when I was young. The art schools were all saying no to me. Um, so I had a couple of years where I was applying to art school and not getting in. Um, and I enrolled in life drawing classes at this Maggie Hamlin's. She did a class once a week. And she and I, she took a liking to me. And uh, she came to see the paintings I was making at home in my bedroom. And she said, you need a proper place to work. And she lent me her garage where she parked her car to become my first studio. And she was the one who really said, you know, you have to work every day. You know, you, for your painting, you have to be there seven days a week, you know, no slacking. Just She really instilled in me the sort of work ethic. Um, but the influences, the formal influences, have for the most part been very old, dead painters. Um, 
<laughs> on Sunday, I arrived in the morning and I looked all day at Bordeaux, Rubens, Titian, um, Bosch, and these are people who I've loved for years and I get so much out of every time. And they seem very much alive to me. I've, so I look at, I would say, mostly art from the past um, with a few more recent. De Kooning, Philip Guston, um, and one or two people who are still around. But yeah. mostly, it's, mostly I, I, I get old masters and things that influence me. I mean, it's really interesting how different a different audience will see the work differently according from, to where they are. Because when my second show in New York, everybody started saying, "Oh, it's so abex. It's all about de Kooning," and I I wasn't thinking about de Kooning at all. I denied it. I thought it's really not so related. And the New York audience really wanted to put me in this box. I actually do feel closer to German painting. I was smiling when Mr. Essel said it because. I joke to my friends I'm an honorary German painter. <laughs> I've had more shows in Germany and this part of the world than anywhere else, certainly America. Um, and I think painting never really went away in the same way in, around here. Um, I do love Richter and Polka. Um, but in a way, I feel like the boundaries between countries have broken down more these days, and people aren't so the need so much to say where you're from. But also because I'm British, living in New York, I don't think people quite know where to place me. Um, um, I don't think it really matters so much. I mean, often people in New York say, oh, how long are you here? And they don't realize I've been living there for 20 years. Uh, they think I'm in England and vice versa. So um, I, don't, I think this is the kind of thing that time will tell. I can't really tell where I fit in. I often feel like I don't really fit in very much at all um, with what my contemporaries are doing. But um, um, I mean, as people often said, you paint like a man from the 50s. Um, well, <laughs> somebody's got to do it. I can't really explain. All I know is I went to New York as an art student, and within minutes I felt like it was like love at first sight. I'd never felt more at home anywhere in my life. I just found the whole thing so stimulating, so exciting. Um, I just knew this was the place I wanted to be. I think in a way, especially for artists, it's important to go a long way away from where you're from, you know, and start your own life somewhere else. Um, and for me, New York was just the obvious place. Um, I mean, now I, it's the only place I've really worked as an adult because I, I went to live there so soon after leaving art school. I've never really tried working anywhere else. Um, but so many things about it, even just the physical properties, the light there is spectacular. You know, um, we have horror, very long winters, but even in the winter you have these incredibly blue, clear days. Um, it's the, uh, I think after coming from London where, you know, it's a massive, sprawling city, you feel the scale of New York is so beautiful. It's very, a hu very much a human scale. Um, I'm talking about Manhattan, not the whole of New York, but, you know, you really, uh, in London I always felt a little bit lost. And a little bit, I think London's quite, you can feel very lonely in London. There's something very uh, like a village about New York. The people on the street, the life of the street is very stimulating. That you just walk out and you see so much, you see so many people. To be honest, after nearly 20 years, I'm getting a little tired uh, of the constant, constant streams of people. And I think partly with having a child, because you're so aware of it from her point of view, that sitting in her poor little buggy with rush, 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 rush. And she's starting to say, you know, she, it's too many people, it's too crowded. And I'm like, I know, I know, I'm sorry. But, so, maybe living in the countryside at some point, but I still, um, there's something, even when you're alone in your studio, the feeling of so much going on outside your window is, uh, is very stimulating. And the atmosphere of work, everyone's, you know, working away. The other thing, just briefly, is New York isn't what it was, so it's gone really downhill now. Um, it was a lot, you know, the money side of things taken over is kind of depressing. 
it's become every neighborhood is more like every other neighborhood, and it doesn't have the same excitement as in the uh, when I was there. Each person always says it was better before. It was better before. I mean, I'm sure in the 70s it was the most fun, but um, but still, there's still it's still a wonderful place. I think.